is the hand that turns these ever-turning wheels? Whence comes the power and the strength? Where dwell the slaves, the giant race that must toil by day and dark to work these miracles? No slaves, no giant. Mark instead these tiny copper strands that stretch across the rim of the seeable world. Listen to this huge dynamo, this thing almost alive, contrived of lifeless things. Here is your slave, your giant. Hold this wire within your hand. It's thinner than a man's finger and stronger than a thousand men. Look, a spark has bridged a fraction of an inch. And like some initial act of creation, a new world begins to form. Mark these things well. Here is the outline of the future here is the power and the pride. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, presents The Power and the Pride, the eighth in a series of programs describing what we believe to be one of the most significant developments of our time, the rebirth of the American South. To report this latter-day industrial revolution, NBC assigned Henry Cassidy, distinguished foreign correspondent, to make a tour through the South and report to us what he saw and heard and felt. Today, he tells us about the development of industrial power in the South, the force that provides the energy for the thousand new factories and plants that have risen across this land. Mr. Cassidy. Giant things can often be measured in tiny ways. The path of a glacier is marked by a few scratches on some rocks. In a sense, the tremendous changes of the French Revolution are summed up in the account of a French baker peddling his wares on the lawn of the palace at Versailles. So in this revolution that I had come to report, it was the seeming small things that persisted in the memory. I knew that power, electric power, would be an excellent gauge or index to the change, and so it was. Huge plants throwing their shadows across an acre or more Power lines that marched in precise formation over the hill and back again. But etched always in the memory is the picture of a small water mill on the banks of a now lazy stream. Once it had been adequate to this little southern town, once its now broken wheel had set the rhythm for this whole land. Men are still alive, I suppose, who could remember when the weed-choked path that leads to its door was heavy with the traffic of busy men. Now deserted and time-haunted, it stands as a symbol of the change that has come. The wheel is stilled. The weather has found a hundred doors in the walls and crumbling roof. What was once a thing of pride is now a dwelling place for bats and creeping things. Surely this was a starting place for my journey. This I would remember. This and the voices that echoed after the sound had died. There's been the greatest awakening in the people. Uh, a desire to really improve their own conditions and do it in their own way. Thirty-five miles due west of Birmingham, a busy little stream, the Mulberry Fork, the local folks call it, joins the Warrior River. Here, where the waters join, rises the large steam plant of the Alabama Power and Light Company, a symbol of the changeover from the past to the present and the future. In earlier times, I suppose, this place would be deserted except for wild things and an occasional hunter. Now it's a stopping place on the long road that we had traveled, a road that leads to factories and electrified farms, to new industries just beginning to develop and old ones revitalized. The steam plant is presided over by a gentleman named A.E. Burnett. Strutt, his friends call him. Here was a starting place. Here was a man who could tell me, in easy, familiar words, the meaning of these moving wheels, these fires, these giant motors, warm with stored-up energy. Well, Gorgas was conceived during World War I. At that time, uh, the government needed some power for the production of ammunition, and uh, the first unit was built in 1916. Later, two additional units was added to this, what we call, the Gorgas Number 1 plant. 
And then as the years went by and the need for power increased, the other four units, beginning with number four in 1928, was installed, and then was followed by number five, and then six and seven. The progress has been always toward more efficient units and to give us a modern steam plant such as the number two plant is now. The process here is to convert the coal into electricity. That's our primary object. We uh, take coal that's produced in the Gorgas mines and put it into the plant. Now the boiler produces steam. It takes the water and converts it into steam at very high pressures and very high temperatures. It'll generate in the uh, approximately a million pounds of steam per hour. The steam then goes from the boiler to the turbine, uh, where it drives the turbine through a series of blades which converts the fuel into mechanical energy and drives the generator. The generator then produces the electricity that goes out on the lines. It will produce 100,000 kilowatt hour every hour that it's in operation. And so the energy is born, the weapons and the matrix of a revolution. Over the hill and into the valley below, a farm wife throws a switch, and within seconds, an oven is heated and ready for the soft dough. Watch these dials as dusk comes to this place. Each nervous movement of the hand means that somewhere, someone is pushing back the night, commanding this energy to pump a well or milk a cow or light the tubes of a radio set. You can measure it precisely in kilowatts. You can see the hands move across the dial. But this is not the whole story. There are changes too subtle for these dials. There are other miracles here that cannot be measured in these terms, nor weighed, nor charted. It was in the office of Mr. C.A. Collier, vice president of the Georgia Power Company, that we picked up the second strand of our story, a story we would follow across the length and breadth of this land. The smaller towns of Georgia in 1944 were frankly in a very bedraggled uh, condition. Their streets were dirty. Uh, there were a great many unpainted buildings. There were a great many buildings in various states of repair. The streets were large and in a great many cases were unpaved. Uh, lack of sidewalks, lack of uh, municipal utilities such as adequate waterworks or sewage systems a wholly inadequate educational system, and all of the other things that suffer as a result of the lack of income. Uh, that was the situation that existed at the time. Uh, the people seemed to have lost the sense of beauty and the sense of orderliness to a greater degree than one would anticipate. Many of us in the North, Mr. Collier, were tremendously impressed with a play that had a long run in New York in the 1930s. It was called Tobacco Road, and as you no doubt know, it painted an extremely unpleasant, a depressing picture of certain rural areas of this state. Is there still a tobacco road in the hills that stretch away out of these cities? Of course, you, you realize that the word tobacco road was used as a symbol. The outgrowth of long-continued uh, poverty, lack of education, and lack of the other cultural things of life. It was probably typical of all parts of America at one time or another. This program, insofar as my observation goes, and that covers pretty well the state because I get over it, I guess, as much as any other one person, uh, has been entirely eliminated, and one would have a very difficult time in finding the material with which to put together another tobacco road story in the state of Georgia. I wondered about the beginnings of these things that I was seeing. What I wondered was the compelling factor, the initial crack in the dam that was to release the pent-up forces of the future. Of course, I know there was no one single factor, but many. There was no single instant of time when the road suddenly turned. So gentle was the turning that it was not noticed by the very ones who were charting the new way. And there were a hundred beginnings. In 1934, Mr. Couch, who was a... Uh founder of this company, got a group of our 
engineers together and said that we wanted to get more farms electrified, that that was uh, one of the best things that could be done for the state. This is Mr. Ritchie, president of the Arkansas Power and Light Company in Little Rock, Arkansas. Here was one beginning at least, a group of engineers gathered together to handle an old problem. It must have seemed a small thing, but the echoes are still sounding. At about that time, it was costing approximately $1,500 a mile to build a rural line. Mr. Scott says, that's too much money. We can't afford it. You fellas have got to get together and do something about it. And told them they had to develop a cheaper method of getting electricity to the farms. Mr. Pittman and his associates developed a smaller transformer and built a rural line like the co-ops are using today and we're using today that cost at that time about $650 per mile. And on February the 22nd, 1935, we dedicated in a little in a schoolhouse at Magnet Cove, Arkansas, the extension of a rural lines into the Magnet Cove and the Prattsville areas on an NBC hookup nationwide. We was swapping electric kilowatt hours for uh, eggs and hens and fryers and so forth. And so the wheels began to turn, and there was more. William Kennedy, again of the Arkansas Power and Light Company, gave us a second chapter. We've been working on this rural development program since 1946. We were faced with a basic problem which was directly involved in the rural expansion program, and that's the fact that in order to run electricity to our farm people, they had to be economically self-sufficient. We were very much interested, along with other rural farm leaders over the state, in seeing that that situation existed. We appreciated very much the fact that we were going through it, an economic change in our farm program here, which was involved in change from cotton to livestock, diversification of other types, and the reason was because we began to have the money here. The war brought that about to some extent, increasing the price of cotton and so forth, and we began to diversify and have livestock. At the same time that we had this economic situation, we were faced with something else. Better jobs in the eastern cities and so forth were taking the people away, and we realized that we had to do something to keep these farm people at home. Mr. Ritchie took up the story. We have a group of young men that go out and meet with the various communities and uh, help them plan to do a better job and to improve their standard of living in their communities. We like to feel like that the rural electrification program in Arkansas started back in 1917 when the Arkansas Power and Light extended uh, their electric lines into the rice fields in the Stuttgart area. At that time, Mr. Couch helped the farmers by purchasing motors and extending them credit and taking mortgages on their crop, not only for the power furnished, but for motors. And, uh, of course, along with uh, at the same time they got their electrified their rice pumping, they also got electricity in their homes. That is the beginning of the rural electrification in the state of Arkansas as we feel it. Our program is on a statewide basis, and the idea behind it was that the only way Arkansas was going to develop was for the individual communities and, and rural areas within the state to get together to develop themselves rather than to have somebody else come in and do it. In order to foster that idea, we, we put on this community contest within the incorporated towns, and at the same time we worked, as Mr. Ritchie told you, very extensively in the rural areas. We put on a balanced farming contest to uh, raise the economic level, and at the same time we, we took care of the social aspects of the rural situation by putting on what we call a rural community improvement program, the idea of which was to get the rural people to band together to better their living conditions by having better community facilities. It was like a circle that turns always back upon itself. More and cheaper power creates a market for more appliances, and this means a need for more power. I found myself faced with the ancient riddle of the priority of the chicken or the egg. It was Mr. Ritchie again who told me how each affects the other. 
the subtle interchange that gives momentum to this 20th century renaissance. Every day there's more and more uses being developed for the use of electricity. The kilowatt hour consumption for per customer is increasing each year as the customer adds on more electrical devices. Our field is pretty well limited to that in the future. That is, the going out and explaining to the rural people how they can use labor-saving devices operated by electricity and save manpower. The uh, cost of electricity has gone down. We've had two rate reductions in the last 15 years, one in 1941 and one in 1944. While the price of everything else has gone up since World War II started, the cost of electricity has continued down, and as we see today, we're going to do everything we know to keep from bringing about any increases, and we feel that we will be able to continue to keep electricity the cheapest thing in the household. And a final word, a quick look at the future, a future that holds no fears, only promise. Here are the words of a revolution as surely as those of Washington or Hamilton. Mr. Kennedy again, ending our interview on a note of triumph. Our weather down here is such that we're able to use an outdoor type of construction which enables us to save money in the building of our plant facilities. In 1940, we had a capacity of some 97,000 kilowatts. Uh, I was checking the figures the other day, and at the present time, our company alone had a total capacity of 586,000 kilowatts. In addition to that, we have long-term contractual obligations for a total of some 205,000 kilowatts. It's been a phenomenal growth, and we'll show you what's going on down here in this state. It's going to continue. Just recently, we were up in New York buying some $18 million worth of bonds for additional expansion, and I expect we'll be back up there next year to see you. The ancient ones, they say, grew contemptuous of miracles because of long and close association. So I found my wonder dulled by miracles made commonplace. But there was one final marvel that would never cease to amaze. It has a ponderous name, underground gasification of coal. It's a process whereby coal stored deep in the mines can be converted to gas and hence to energy without being brought to the surface, without once seeing the sun that long ago gave it birth. Here's James Elder, who's a supervising engineer of the U.S. Bureau of Mines, assigned here at Gorgas, Alabama. Mr. Elder, I w- they tell me that you have a very interesting experiment going here, and I wonder if you could tell me what it is. Yes, we're working on the underground gasification of coal. The uh, Bureau of Mines and the Alabama Power Company have been cooperating in experimentation along these lines since 1946-47. Our aim is to recover the energy of the coal without mining it and putting it to useful work. Now, you know I'm a complete novice on this subject. How can you mine coal without mining it? (laughs) Uh, By not mining it, I mean it isn't necessary to bring the coal itself above ground. Let's bring the energy out instead of the coal itself. And how do you go about doing that? Uh, The latest methods that have been used at Gorgas include the drilling of holes from the surface to the coal bed, spaced about 150 feet apart. An electrode is placed in the coal bed at each hole. A current is passed between them. The coal is fired by electricity, changed into coke and fired by electricity. And uh, as the current passes through the coal, coke is formed, which is porous, and permits the passage of air or other gases. After we have carbonized a reasonable amount of coal underground, we we remove the electric current and pass air in one of the holes and take gases out of the other one. The air goes down to the coal bed, reacts with the carbon, forms carbon monoxide and hydrogen, and comes out at the other end of the system. The carbon monoxide and the hydrogen are largely responsible for the heating value of the gases, which is another way of saying the energy of the coal bed. To follow this story, it was necessary to descend into a mine, roll through I don't know how many winding caverns, until it seemed I had reached the dwelling place of the cosmic fires that they say still burn as on the first cataclysmic day of the formation of the world. 
Gorgas, Alabama, a huge hole like some gaping mouth loomed up before us. Here was the final miracle, but if you would observe this miracle, you must follow a road that winds out of sunlight into darkness. We're riding down now into the coal mine at Gorgas, Alabama. We're riding in something they call a jeep. It looks more to me like a roller coaster. It's a flat little railroad trolley. Seven of us sitting in the jeep. Hal Snyder with his light on and his tin helmet. A pair of blue overalls. So they gave me khaki overalls for some reason that I don't understand. We've uh, had a little lecture before we go down. We've been told that mines are not dangerous, but they are confining, and a lot of heavy equipment moves around in them in a narrow space, and therefore each one of us has been assigned one of the mine supervisors. We had to stay with him. Lights on in the helmets now. We're going down the trolley into the Gorgas coal mine. Off the siding we go now, onto the single track that leads down into the mine. It's a very low entrance. Everyone keeps his head down pitch darkness ahead of us except for a narrow ring of lights, a single line of lights. Looks like a necklace, a necklace of gold on a black velvet dress. And now we're down in the mine where the actual extraction of coal is taking place. Hal, I take it that is the continuous miner I've been hearing about. Yes, the machine directly ahead there that's doing the actual mining of the coal is a continuous miner. How, how does that work, Hill? As you see, there are six cutting chains which literally rip out the coal with the teeth of the chains. They toss it back onto a conveyor which carries it back over the length of the mining machine and dumps it into a what we call a shuttle car. Well, Hell, how many men are working this uh, continuous cutter? We have six on this section. There's six men on this one machine? On all of the machines that you see here. That, in, con, that includes the continuous miner, a loader, which operates directly behind the miner, cleaning up, and the two shuttle cars. Well, how about the miner itself? How many men does that take? It takes two. And about how much do they cut a day? They will mine over 300 tons a day. And uh, how many men would have been taken in the old days to get that much coal? Well, probably uh, 70 men. In other words, then, Hal, here, two men and this machine do as much work as 70 men used to do in the old days. Uh, yes, along with the other four men who helped them get the coal <laughs> on out. How long have you been using this, Hal? Since January of 1950. We got our first one at that date. We have since added five more. Well, what's that done to the output of the mines? Do you have any figures on that? Well, it has doubled the output of the mine, and uh, we do it much more safely. I want to would like to add that point, because in using the continuous miner, uh, no explosives are used to blast the coal, and as a result, we don't affect the roof as we did in the old days, when we drilled and blasted it. Well, that makes me think, Hal, another thing. I don't see any props for this pit. In other words, we're just sitting here in a cavern of, of uh, rock. And it seems to me in the old days they used to have wooden props, didn't they? In the old days, we did use wooden props. But nowadays, we support the roof by bolting it up. A hole is drilled about four feet deep, and a bolt is placed in the hole... Uh, with a, an expanding type bolt, and by fastening the bolt up tight against the roof, the roof is supported without the use of the timbers. Uh, another thing, Hal, it's cool down here. It was warm when we came in. It's cool here. How, how do you keep it this way? And I might say, too, the air is sweet. That's, we keep it cool uh, by forcing ventilation currents through the mines with the use of a a large fan that you saw as we entered the pit mouth. Well, this is a modern mine, all right, Hal. Uh, where did you study? Because you must have studied to get this job. At the University of Kentucky. Uh, mining engineering. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Hal. This 
been the greatest awakening in the people. Uh, a desire to really improve their own conditions and do it in their own way. To take what they've got and to build it into whatever it's possible to be built into. To take their own local know-how and own local capital and own own uh, local labor and and process their own raw resources into the finished product, largely for their own market. And there's been an unusual job of that done in this Mid-South area. One final voice, C. Hamilton Moses, chairman of the board of the Arkansas Power and Light Company. Here is the cause and the effect, the beginning and the end. Tell us, Mr. Moses, what brought about these changes that we have seen? Well, uh, an awakening of the people very largely because of the leadership in the, in the three states, particularly in Arkansas. There's been a statewide business organization called the Arkansas Economic Council that was organized in 1942 to go out and get the people to do whatever it is that communities and people can do. Just let me give you a few instances. Uh, take our power company's Plant to Prosper campaign. We went out and by giving prizes got... To, a large number of the farmers way out in rural sections of Arkansas to enter into a contest to see as to who could do the best job and budget it himself, building a better economy on the farm, building better homes, a better place for his uh, people and the rural folks to live. And the first year, 15,000 different farm families entered into that contest. It's... Uh, won quite a bit of recognition out over the country, and it's being done in a number of places. Another thing was rural electrification. Uh, I doubt if there's anything that's happened uh, in our area that's given the people more hope and put a little bit more zest into the life of the rural folks than rural electrification. And, uh, by the way, you'll be surprised to know that our state in Arkansas is right at the tops in rural electrification. And that, that's been accomplished very largely since the war. Our company, uh, the Arkansas Power and Light, to per its size and per number of customers, has carried more lights to farmhouses than any other private utility in America. And our 18 rural electric cooperatives have done a first-class job, and Arkansas now is what you can call 90% rural electrified. It sounds to me, Mr. Moses, as though here what you're doing is building spiritually. Uh, pretty much we were finding uh, physical changes. They were changing their cattle or they were improving their soil. And here you're improving the spirit. Well, uh, Mr. Cassidy, uh, I believe that's correct. And I, I believe that our experience down there has taught us that, that, number one, you've got to go out and lead the people into a better spirit and into a better frame of mind so they'll go out and build better places and better communities in which to live before you can do any too much in building industrially and uh, physically. We found that there's uh, thousands of concerns all over this nation, especially in the north and east, looking for new places to go and new homes for their people and a little bit more sunshine and climate. But they had a hard time finding it. And it led us to the conclusion that our first job was to go out and get our people organized to build better communities in which to live and build more inviting uh, rural life and community life down there. And when we did that, concerns all over the nation would come and look us up. And we believe that's proven true now. This was the miracle that we found. This, the revolution born of cosmic things deep in the womb of the earth. Trace its path in power lines that stretch across the hills. Measure it in ancient roads repaved now and lighted. You can see a part of it each time a dynamo turns or a generator hums with energy. You can hear it in the triumphant voices. A hand moves across a dial. Night comes, but the darkness is beaten back in a thousand places. Wheels, too big for turning, move as though a thousand men were lending the strength of their arms and backs. This is the weapon of the revolution that has come to this land. This is the power and the pride. Listening to The Power and the Pride, the eighth in a series, Heritage Over the Land, describing the changes that have lately come to the American South. This series is written and directed by William Allen Bales and produced by Miss Lee F. Payton. 
It is anticipated that future series will deal with developments in other sections of the country. Next week, the story of petrochemicals.